What's going on guys? It's uh, Greg here and uh, just wanted to do a video today about another SHTF scenario and today I'm going to talk about a uh, nuclear, nuclear power plant uh, scenario. Uh, so in this scenario you live nearby a nuclear power plant. Uh, it could be within 10 miles, it could be one mile or right across the street or it could be 20 or 30 miles away it could be 50 to 100 miles away but uh you're in a you're in proximity to a nuclear power plant and um so what so the scenario here is that uh sorry guys it's raining so you may hear some uh raindrops on my windshield but um so the scenario here is that you know you're at work or you're at home and uh, all of a sudden you hear the uh, emergency alert system going off on uh, TV or radio and um, there's a the message states that there's a nuclear power plant had some kind of uh, mechanical failure uh, or possible meltdown either partial meltdown or full meltdown or some some other type of uh, mechanical problem you know that would cause you to have to evacuate the area and I'm not going to really get into specifics of uh, you know how nuclear power plants can fail but uh, I encourage everybody to you know read about nuclear power plants and learn about uh, how that they how they fail and what are some of the ways that radiation could be released from a nuclear power plant it's not just a meltdown there could be uh, for example, some uh, radioactive waste uh, that's that you know gets exposed to the air uh, or leaks uh, because a lot of the the, the waste from the, uh, the like uh, for example the spent uh, fuel rods the nuclear fuel rods they have to store those somewhere um, and there's a lot of radioactive waste that is given off during a you know a nuclear reaction and they they have to store that permanently it doesn't break down that quickly it breaks down over tens of thousands of years and that nuclear waste a lot of times is stored on site right next to the nuclear plant it's stored inside of uh, tanks concrete tanks underground that are uh, very thick concrete to protect from gamma rays um, so but that's just some of the many ways it's not just a total meltdown there could be other ways that nuclear radiation is released but Anyway, uh, you know, I encourage you guys to do some research on that and, and you know, you can really read about all the different uh, types of nuclear power plant failures uh, that happen across this country. Some of the, the biggest one was Three Mile Island in uh, Pennsylvania on the Susquehanna River. So you can read about the Three Mile Island incident, it's very interesting. Um, but there's a lot of nuclear power plants that, that periodically they have some radiation releases and uh, so it doesn't have to be a total meltdown scenario like, you know, Fukushima or Chernobyl for it to be a, a situation where you have to evacuate. And, um, you know, it's good to have some preparations for that. It's good to be aware of, you know, where, like where to go, you know, understanding basic, you know, nuclear principles. So this way you, you kind of know which direction to, to go in. Um, you know, obviously you're not going to want to go in an area where the prevailing winds are because if there's a meltdown uh, or some type of radiation release it's going to follow where the winds are going so you don't want to be downwind of the nuclear plant you know you want to go upwind or in the opposite direction of the wind um, so for example it, if the if the winds are coming from the south you, you know you don't want to go to the north because if you go to the north you're going to be you know in the line of fire so to speak from the uh, nuclear radioactive you know fallout or debris whatever the radioactive cloud um, another thing to think about too is is I encourage everybody to also read up on Chernobyl and familiarize yourself with uh, what can happen when a nuclear power plant uh, you know melts down and you know Chernobyl has gave us the best you know example of, of what to expect from a meltdown because it's really uh, a standalone situation where uh, you know there was a total meltdown of the nuclear core um, 
also Fukushima as well. Fukushima is another one. Um, you know, Fukushima and Chernobyl. But Chernobyl is a good example because uh, a lot of people think that, you know, just because they don't live close by to a nuclear plant that, you know, let's say that they're, you know, a couple hundred miles away, that they're safe. You know, they don't have to worry about anything. But that's not the, that's not the case, actually, because, you know, when Chernobyl happened, um, a lot of people in different countries in Eastern Europe and even as far as Sweden, uh, you know, were exposed to radioactive contamination. Um, there was high levels of radiation in, in places that were, you know, almost a thousand miles away, you know, places in Sweden, which is very far from Ukraine. Um, and, you know, there was different types of uh, alerts and different types of bans. For example, you weren't allowed to eat f uh, food from the forests like mushrooms or berries, stuff like that. Things that can uh, accumulate radioactive uh, you know, radiation, um, even people in neighboring countries like Poland, for example, uh, you know, were exposed to high levels of radiation, even though, you know, they were hundreds of miles away. Um, so it's definitely something to think about, something to read about, you know, you should definitely familiarize yourself with Chernobyl. Uh, that's definitely a classic meltdown scenario. And, uh, you know, and the biggest lesson from that one is that you don't have to live, you know, 20 miles away to be in the line of fire. You know, you could be hundreds of miles away and still be affected by a nuclear power plant meltdown. Um, Fukushima is another one that was very, very catastrophic situation in Fukushima. Um, you know, but it's good to uh, familiarize yourself with that and, and also understanding principles of uh, radioactive breakdown and decay. You know, um, one thing to remember about a nuclear power plant, which makes it actually more dangerous than a uh, nuclear bomb, is that um, because you're dealing with nuclear fuel, uh, you know, it's like enriched uranium or, you know, I'm not a nuclear engineer, but it's usually like enriched uranium. And, um, you know, usually it doesn't break down that quickly. Uh, like, like a nuclear, when there's a nuclear bomb attack, the, the radioactive fallout, it breaks down after a couple days to a few weeks. The radioactive fallout is, is, is broken down already and the radiation levels uh, subside, you know. But because with a nuclear power plant, you have that radioactive core, which is the enriched uranium. Um, you know, that stuff doesn't break down for thousands and thousands of years. So once it melts down into the ground, you know, that whole area is... is, is is, is uh, off limits for, for, for thousands of years, you know. Um, that's why actually right now in Chernobyl, they're building, they had to build a containment dome over the area where the old power plant was. They built like a giant containment dome from metal or I don't know exactly what it is, but they had to place it over where the core melted down to keep the radiation levels under control so it so it's actually you know not not still giving off you know lethal doses of radiation to the surrounding area um, but even there's actually an exclusion zone around Chernobyl that's about 10 to 20 miles and even that area if you go on YouTube you can actually look up um, videos of people that you know they take uh, adventure trips there uh, there was even a movie that was made about it called Chernobyl Diaries. It's like a horror movie, but um, you know, people take trips there into the exclusion zone because it's very secluded. There's no human, uh, there's no people there because it's it's an excluded zone. It's it's uh, you're not allowed to to walk in there unless you have permission or you know you're a military Ukrainian military. Um, so there's a lot of uh, wildlife there and it's very very secluded area but the whole area there is still has a high level of radiation and this is you know 30 years ago or whatever 1982 I think it was um, so you know you're looking at what is that 35 years 30 almost around 35 years ago and there's still you know lethal doses to very high doses of radiation within 10 to 20 miles of where 
the power plant melted down so you know if you live within 10 to 20 miles of a, a nuclear power plant you should definitely be prepared for an for, for evacuating you know um, you should have you know at, at the very least you want to have some type of a go bag you know a bug out bag or whatever you want to call it um, but you want to have supplies with you so you can load up your vehicle and escape um, and, and get out of the area you know um, you also want to maybe have a uh, gas mask to protect your lungs if there's a radiation release you, you don't want to breathe in any kind of uh, radioactive particulates or you know you want to protect your lungs from from radiation because uh, you know that could be very dangerous you you know you can damage your lungs you can get lung cancer um, so you know a gas mask will help with that you know you could even look into getting some uh, radiation resistant uh, clothing you know like PPE you know uh, that can you know protect you from you know ra radiation so in case the radiation is getting high you can you can don that suit and you can give it to your family members as you drive away in your vehicle and you escape um, and a couple other things is obviously you're going to want to have potassium iodide. Potassium iodide, what that does is uh, it saturates the thyroid gland with uh, iodine, basically pota the potassium iodide, which is a non-radioactive version of iodine. And when you saturate your thyroid gland with, with non-radioactive iodine, it's going to prevent or, or lessen the chances of radioactive iodine being uh, absorbed and stored inside of the thyroid. You know, because the thyroid gland by nature, what it does is it hoards iodine because iodine is not a very common mineral and it's very essential for our bodies. So what happens is when there's a radioactive, uh, you know, situation, you know, a nuclear or radiological situation, like a power plant meltdown, there's going to be radioactive iodine, which is iodine-131, and uh, our bodies are going to hoard the radioactive version of the iodine, which you're going to be exposed to, and our bodies don't know the difference between the radioactive and the non-radioactive, it just hoards it as if it was normal iodine and then that can damage your thyroid gland you know permanently and uh, you know your thyroid gland is critical for various bodily functions you know it regulates metabolism it regulates hormones uh, so you definitely don't want to you know damage your thyroid so potassium iodide you know some uh, PPE personal protective equipment which can you know uh, pro provide some type of shielding to radiation in, in the case that, you know, let's say they give an evacuation order and, you know, many times, you know, we live in a world where we think that we're always going to be notified of everything, you know, days in advance, like with a hurricane, for example, but uh, in a radioactive, you know, situation like a nuclear power plant, there's not going to be much warning, you know, what's going to basically happen is there's going to be some type of mechanical failure, uh, some type of leakage. And, and the radiation's already going to start to be, you know, exposed to the air. And at that point, they're going to give the orders to, you know, give out an EAS signal. And so you're not going to really have, you know, time to prepare. You're going to really have to get out of there quickly, especially if there's very high doses of radiation. You're not going to really want to stay around too long because you can easily give yourself a, uh, you know, a, a high level dose, which is not good. Um, so you know you want to have the PPE, the potassium iodide, gas masks. You want to at the very least have a go bag for every individual in your in your household. You know your kids, your wife. Um, you know even something for your pets. You know have some food and water for them. You know ready to go so you can just throw it in your car and get out of Dodge. Um, ideally, if you had some, you know other preps ready to go you know that would be ideal like if you had canisters of uh you know food that you could you know load up in there um things of that nature you know food you know food and water you know that's going to be important and um so that's just like a little uh discussion on nuclear power plants and uh you know there's just so many nuclear power plants in this country if you look at a map you can go on uh the, I think it's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You can go on their website 
and it'll show you the locations of all the nuclear power plants in the US um, I'm gonna try to uh, send put a link in the description box below I'm gonna put a link below so you guys can see um, you know where the power plants are in your state and in your region of the country but you know pretty much the East Coast of the United States has the most densest concentration of nuclear power plants you know there's at least in, in some states like Florida, New Jersey, New York, um, a lot of the heavily populated states, there's at least three to five power plants in each state. You know, Florida has, I think, five power plants. You know, New, New York, there's uh, Indian Point, which is very close to New York City, and it's actually close to where I live. I'm only about 20 miles away from Indian Point, tw uh, maybe 30 miles away, actually. Um, and uh, there, you know, there's also a huge metropolitan area next to this power plant, which is New York City. Um, they're planning on closing it down in a couple of years, but you know, you should be familiar with where the nuclear power plants are in your state, how many there are, um, and then think about you know the prevailing winds in your part of the country based on the season. You know, so typically like. In the summertime, where I am, I'm in uh, the lower Hudson Valley of New York. Um, the prevailing winds come from usually the southwest or the southeast in the summertime. And in the wintertime, they usually come from the northwest. Um, you know, so you want to just be familiar with, you know, the prevailing winds. Um, and just remember that you don't want to drive downwind of... of if there's a nuclear power plant meltdown, you don't want to go downwind of that. You want to go upwind. You want to go in the opposite direction of the wind. Um, so that's pretty much it for this one. Uh, so, you know, read about Chernobyl, read about Fukushima, but I highly recommend, you know, reading about Chernobyl. Uh, you know, Three Mile Island is a good one too. You know, Fukushima is a good one as well, but it's kind of. Uh, Fukushima was caused by the flooding that was, you know, related to the earthquake. Um, it had to do with where they placed some of their, the way the power plant was designed. It, it wasn't designed to handle that kind of flooding. But Chernobyl is a very good case study uh, on nuclear power plants, uh, meltdowns that, you know, all preppers should uh, be familiar with. You know, you can learn a lot about you know nuclear power plant meltdowns and and the and the effects of the nuclear power plant meltdown you know in a real world case study which would be the uh, Chernobyl situation um, you know and uh, that's pretty much it for now so uh, I'll catch you guys on the next one take care God bless and uh, keep prepping